And welcome to the fourth quarter and full year 2020 financial results conference call and webcast for your letters. Hosting the call today is Steve Frank, Vice President of Investor Relations for Zoetta. The presentation materials and additional financial tables are currently posted on the Investor Relations section of Zoetis.com. The presentation slides can be managed by you, the viewer, and will not be forwarded automatically. In addition, a replay of this call will be available approximately two hours after the conclusion of this call via dial-in information or the Investor Relations section of Zoetis.com. At this time, all participants have been placed in a listen-only mode. The floor will be open for your questions following the presentation. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. If at any point your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. In the interest of time, we ask that you limit yourself to one question and then queue up again with any follow-up. Your line will be muted when you complete your question. When closing your question, please pick up your handset to allow optimal sound quality. Lastly, if you should require operator assistance, please press star zero. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Steve Frank. Steve, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Zoetis fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings call. I am joined today by Kristen Peck, our Chief Executive Officer, and Glenn David, our Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I'll remind you that the slides presented on this call are available on the Investor Relations section of our website, and that our remarks today will include forward-looking statements, and that actual results could differ materially from those projections. For a list and description of certain factors that could cause results to differ, I refer you to the forward-looking statement in today's press release and our SEC filings, including, but not limited, to our annual report on Form 10-K and our reports on Form 10-Q. Our remarks today will also include references to certain financial measures, which were not prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles or U.S. GAAP, a reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to the most directly comparable U.S. GAAP measures is included in the financial tables that accompany our earnings press release and in the company's 8K filing dated today, February 16, 2021. We also cite operational results, which exclude the impact of foreign exchange. And with that, I will turn the call over to Kristen. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I hope you and your loved ones are all staying healthy. As we all know, we're still experiencing hard times in many regions as COVID cases continue and new variants of the virus emerge. But I hope you share my optimism that with progress on vaccinations and continued adherence to safety protocols, better days are ahead. The year 2020 will be remembered for COVID-19, but for Zoetis, it also reaffirms the resilience of our business, the essential nature of animal health, and the agility and dedication of our colleagues in the face of industry and personal challenges. Throughout the year, we successfully ensured colleague safety and maintain reliable supply for our customers. We kept driving innovation and strengthening our diverse portfolio of 13 blockbusters and more than 300 product lines across eight species and seven major product categories. We successfully launched our triple combination parasiticides and paracatrio. We also achieved approvals for the first ever long acting monoclonal antibodies for osteoarthritis pain in dogs and cats with Robrella's authorization for dogs in the European Union and several other markets, and Silencia's first authorization for cats in Switzerland. We also continue to build on our vaccine portfolio in livestock with the approval of our Circle Max MHIO swine vaccine in the European Union. And in poultry, we continued advancing our recombinant vector vaccine with the approval of Polvac Preserta HVT IBD in the U.S. Meanwhile, in diagnostics, we successfully launched VetScan Images, a breakthrough platform using cloud-based artificial intelligence for veterinary clinics. We were able to do all this while staying anchored to our purpose and advancing the five long-term priorities that I set out at the beginning of the year, including sustainability, where we made important progress in our ESG programs and metric reporting. We look forward to sharing our long-term ESG goals in the coming weeks. And finally, we delivered financial results for 2020 that were in line with the guidance we provided last February before the impact of the global pandemic was known. For the full year, we generated 9% operational growth in revenue, primarily based on new products in our companion animal business, 
the continued strength of our key dermatology portfolio, and growth in China. As part of our long-term value proposition, we once again grew revenues faster than the anticipated growth for 2020, and faster than the historical industry rates of 4 to 6%. As part of our value proposition, we also delivered on growing our adjusted net income faster than revenue. For the full year, we delivered operational growth of 10% in adjusted net income, while adapting our operations to the pandemic and continuing investments in our pipeline and new product launches. We generated strong fourth quarter results, which Glenn will discuss in a minute. And these performance trends give us confidence in our growth drivers and strong momentum for 2021. We expect to continue growing revenue faster than the market in 2021, driven by ongoing strength in pet care, continued expansion in markets outside the U.S., most notably China, and acceleration of our diagnostics portfolio penetration. We are guiding to operational growth of 9 to 11% in revenue for full year 2021. Growth expectations for the companion animal market are in the mid-single digits, and we expect Zoetis to grow significantly faster than that based on the continued uptake of Symperica Trio, the strength of our key dermatology portfolio, and the launch of monoclonal antibodies in markets outside the U.S. Positive pet care trends during the pandemic, based on increased adoptions and people spending more time with their pets, should continue driving market growth in the near term. Data in the U.S. shows visits to veterinary clinics have rebounded, and the average revenue per visit has continued to increase. Over the long term, we see these trends moderating as adoption rates normalize and people eventually return to the workplace. The specialty care regimens and chronic care treatments that began in the pandemic should continue, and our innovative portfolio across dermatology, parasiticides, pain, vaccines, and diagnostics have us well positioned for continued growth and capturing share as these shifts occur. In terms of the livestock market, we expect low single-digit market growth in 2021 as the impact from COVID-19 will still be felt and a number of products experience loss of exclusivity. We expect Zoetis to grow in line with the market even as we face increased headwinds from generic competition for Draxin, our leading anti-infective product. We are confident we can leverage our life cycle innovation strategies together with the overall diversity of our livestock portfolio, including swine product sales in China, to help us address the loss of exclusivity for Draxin and maintain livestock growth that will support our 2021 guidance. Longer term, we will continue to invest in livestock innovations and data-driven animal agricultural solutions. As we continue through 2021, we will be building on the progress against our five priorities, driving innovative growth, enhancing customer experience, leading in digital and data analytics, cultivating a high-performing organization, and championing a healthier, more sustainable future. Our investment plans and focus on growth for 2021 include continuing the successful launch of Symperica Trio in the U.S. and other markets, as well as the ongoing adoption of other new parasiticides, Revolution Plus and ProHeart 12, driving growth in dermatology through increased use of direct-to-consumer advertising and disease awareness campaigns in the U.S. and globally. Our focus remains on growing this market and increasing customer loyalty to our innovative treatments, which we expect to help us top $1 billion in annual sales for the first time. As noted earlier, we will be investing in the launch of the first monoclonal antibodies for osteoarthritis pain in dogs and cats in Europe in the first half of 2021, and advancing the regulatory process in the U.S. and other markets. While we remain confident in the eventual U.S. approval of these products based on the safety and efficacy data we submitted, at this point, we believe it is unlikely we will receive approvals for Silencia or Labrella in the U.S. in 2021. We continue to work through regulatory reviews and manufacturing inspections with the FDA, and we will continue to keep you updated on this process on future calls. And finally, we're continuing our development of digital and data solutions that will support more individualized animal care and more efficient and sustainable operations for producers. In conclusion, I'm incredibly proud of what our people accomplished in the face of such uncertainty during 2020, and it gives me great confidence in our continued success and full year guidance for 2021. As we navigate through recovery from the global pandemic and capitalize on the growth opportunities we see ahead, my optimism comes from what drove us over the last year the resilience and essential nature of the animal health industry, the diversity, innovation, and market leadership of our portfolio, 
and the agility and passion of our colleagues to face any challenge. Now, let me hand it off to Glenn, who will speak more about our fourth quarter results and guidance for the full year 2021. Thank you, Kristen, and good morning, everyone. We had another exceptional year with revenue of $6.7 billion and adjusted net income of $1.8 billion, both exceeding the high end of our November full year guidance range. Full year revenue grew 9% operationally and 7% on a reported basis, with adjusted net income increasing 10% operationally and 5% on a reported basis. Going deeper into the numbers, price contributed 2% to full year operational revenue growth with volume contributing 7%. Volume growth consisted of 3% from new products, 3% from key dermatology products, and 1% from acquisitions, with other inline products flat for the year. We again saw broad-based revenue growth, with the U.S. growing 11% and international growing 7% operationally. The innovation we brought to the market and the diversity of our portfolio was key to our strong performance, as companion animal grew 17%, while livestock was flat on a year-over-year -year basis. Performance in Companion Animal was led by our parasiticide portfolio, bolstered by the launch of Semparica Trio, which generated revenue of $170 million. This added approximately $150 million of incremental revenue and exceeded our expectations set prior to the pandemic. Sales of Semparica also grew double digits for the year with operational revenue growth of 16%. Our key dermatology portfolio demonstrated continued strength in 2020, growing 23% operationally, generating revenue of $925 million and increasing more than $170 million versus prior year. The COVID-19 pandemic created a difficult market environment for livestock. However, we are encouraged by the resiliency displayed in 2020. We remain optimistic that global livestock will return to modest growth in 2021 as the recovery from African swine fever in China continues and consumption patterns normalize. Operational growth and adjusted net income of 10% were driven mainly by strong revenue growth and operating margin expansion. Now moving on to our Q4 financial results, where we posted another strong quarter with revenue of $1.8 billion, representing an increase of 9% operationally and 8% reported. Adjusted net income of $438 million is an increase of 3% operationally and flat on a reported basis. Operational revenue grew 9%, with 2% from price and 7% from volume. Volume growth of 7% consisted of 4% from new products, 3% from key dermatology products, 1% from acquisitions, and a decline of 1% from other inline products. Companion animal products led the way in terms of species growth, growing 25% operationally, while livestock declined 5% operationally in the quarter. Companion animal parasiticides grew 52% in the quarter, gaining market share in the U.S. of more than 7% within the flea tick and heartworm segment, versus the same period in the prior year. This includes the continued adoption of Semparica Trio, which generated sales of $60 million in Q4. Our key dermatology products, Apoquel and Cytopoint, again had significant global growth in the quarter with $257 million of revenue, representing 27% operational growth versus an extremely difficult comparative period in which key derm grew 29% for the fourth quarter of last year. Our diagnostics portfolio, again, made positive contributions to revenue with reference lab expansion and double-digit growth in consumable and instrument revenue. The recovery and wellness visits continued to be a catalyst for growth following the slowdown from social distancing restrictions earlier in the year. As we noted on our previous earnings call, the early fall cattle run pulled a portion of fourth quarter sales into the third quarter, leading to a weaker quarter in cattle than we would typically expect. This was the primary driver of the 5% operational decline in livestock for the fourth quarter. For the remainder of the livestock portfolio, Swine posted a second consecutive quarter of growth, with the herd rebuild continuing key accounts as the market recovers from African swine fever in China. Our aquaculture business grew high single digits in the quarter, and along with swine, partially offset the decline in cattle and poultry. Now moving on to revenue growth by segment for the quarter. U.S. revenue grew 11%, with companion animal products growing 30%, and livestock sales declining by 15%. For Companion Animal, 
The positive trends at the vet clinic continued in Q4 with patient visits up 2% and revenue per visit increasing by 13%. Companion animal growth in the quarter was driven by sales of our Symparica franchise as well as key dermatology products. We maintained an increased investment in direct consumer advertising in both therapeutic areas and continue to see a good return on that investment. Symparica Trio performed well again in the quarter with sales of $56 million. We remain extremely encouraged for the future growth of our product and the growth of the overall market segment as a material portion of Trio sales came from new patients to the category. Key dermatology sales were $176 million for the quarter, growing 32%, with significant growth for Apoquel and Cytopoint. Our investments to support the franchise have been instrumental in driving more patients into the clinics. Companion animal diagnostic sales increased 22% in the quarter as a result of reference lab expansion and growth in point-of-care instruments and consumables. U.S. livestock declined 15% in the quarter, driven primarily by cattle, which had a portion of Q4 sales pulled into the third quarter as a result of the earlier movement from pasture to feedlot. The remaining species declined as well, with COVID-19 and pricing pressure negatively impacting our swine business. Poultry declines are largely attributed to product rotation and less producer profitability, leading to reduced uses of our premium products. To summarize U.S. performance, innovation and return on investment once again drove exceptionally strong growth in companion animal. While livestock was down in the quarter, the results were in line with our expectations. Revenue in our international segment grew 7% operationally in the quarter. Companion animal revenue grew 17% operationally, and livestock revenue grew 2% operationally. Increased sales of companion animal products resulted from growth in our parasiticide portfolio, vaccines, and key dermatology products. Parasiticide growth in the quarter was again driven by the Symparica franchise with further adoption of Symparica Trio. In Q4, we observed a series of favorable market trends, such as increased pet ownership and medicalization rates in Asia. Overall, companion animal grew in every major market except Italy and the UK, which had arguably the strictest lockdown protocols. Companion animal diagnostics grew 16% in the quarter, led by an increase in point of care consumable usage. Swine revenue grew 14% operationally, posting a third consecutive quarter of double-digit growth. Swine sales in China grew in excess of 100% for the second straight quarter. Key accounts expanded their use of vaccines and other products as they continue to rebuild herds from smaller farms to large-scale operations. China total products grew 45% operationally in the quarter and 34% operationally for 2020. Brazil was also a significant contributor to international growth in the quarter, growing 18% operationally. For the fourth quarter and full year 2020, Brazil delivered double-digit growth in all species except poultry, which modestly declined. Overall, our international segment delivered strong results despite the challenges presented by COVID-19. Our diversity across products and geographies enabled our international segment to again be a significant driver of growth. Now moving on to the rest of the P&L for the quarter. Adjusted gross margin of 67.7% fell 80 basis points on a reported basis compared to the prior year, resulting from other manufacturing costs, inventory charges, recent acquisitions, and elevated freight expense. This was partially offset by favorable product mix and price increases. Adjusted operating expenses increased 10% operationally, resulting from increased advertising and promotion expense for Symparica Trio and Applequel, partially offset by t and &E savings. Return on investment from our DTC campaigns has been very favorable and, we remain, and will remain an important investment to support future growth of the business. The adjusted effective tax rate for the quarter was 13.5%, a decrease of 70 basis points, driven by the impact of net discrete tax benefits, partially offset by the jurisdictional mix of earnings. And finally, Adjusted net income and adjusted diluted EPS for the quarter grew 3% operationally. In December, we announced a 25% annual dividend increase, continuing our commitment to grow our dividend at or faster than the growth in adjusted net income. In addition, we resumed our share repurchase program in January with $1.4 billion of remaining capacity under the current authorization. 
Now moving on to guidance for 2021. Please note that guidance reflects foreign exchange rates as of late January for 2021. We are projecting revenue between 7.4 and $7.55 billion, representing 9% to 11% operational growth. We are expecting foreign exchange favorability in 2021 of approximately 200 basis points. We expect companion animal to be the primary driver of growth in 2021 with the continued strength of our diverse parasiticide portfolio, which includes full year of parica trio sales. We believe market dynamics for companion animal will remain strong in 2021, allowing for further expansion of our key dermatology products, as well as our diagnostics offerings, which we anticipate will grow faster than the overall animal health market. While we expect the pace of certain trends that accelerated in 2020 to moderate, such as increased spend per visit, our view is that 2020 has established a higher base for future growth. We anticipate livestock will return to global growth in 2021, primarily driven by more normalized food consumption patterns. Geographically, we expect total company sales growth to be relatively balanced between our U.S. and international segments. However, we do expect continued and meaningful growth in China and other emerging markets. I'd like to touch upon the key assumptions that underpin our expectations for revenue growth. Beginning with dermatology, our guidance does not assume a meaningful competitive entry in 2021 and with continued investment behind the franchise, we believe revenue will exceed $1 billion for the full year. We also do not assume a triple combination product will launch in the U.S. in 2021 to compete against Imparica Trio. We're extremely excited about our monoclonal antibodies for pain with both Labrella and Silencia having long-term blockbuster potential. However, as Kristen mentioned, while both products will launch in the first half of 2021 in the EU and other international markets, we do not currently expect either product to receive approval in the U.S. this year. For the remainder of the P&L, adjusted cost of sales as a percentage of revenue is expected to be approximately 30%, which is relatively consistent with our cost of sales in 2020. Adjusted SG&A expenses for the year are expected to be between 1.775 and $1.85 billion, with the increase in 2020 focused on supporting primary drivers of revenue growth, including recent and future product launches, key brands, and recent acquisitions and reference lab expansion and diagnostics. Adjusted R&D expense for 2021 is expected to be between $500 and $520 million as we remain committed to investing in pipeline opportunities for new therapies and life cycle innovation. Adjusted interest and other income deductions is expected to be approximately $260 million with the increase over 2020 driven by increased interest expense as well as lower interest income. Our adjusted effective tax rate for 2021 is expected to be approximately 20%. The increase in 2021 is primarily related to the impact of favorable, non-recurring discrete items that occurred in 2020. Adjusted net income is expected to be in the range of $2.08 to $2.13 billion, representing operational growth of 9 to 12%. Our guidance reflects our value proposition of growing revenue in line with or faster than the market and growing adjusted net income faster than revenue during a year when we'll be making meaningful investments to support future growth. Consistent with 2020, we are anticipating elevated capital expenditures in 2021 to support investments in manufacturing focused on internal sourcing of API, capacity increases, and facilities to support pipeline opportunities. We're also investing in information technology to support our recent acquisitions, as well as digital capabilities and data analytics. Finally, we expect adjusted diluted EPS to be in the range of $4.36 to $4.46 and reported Zulu EPS to be in the range of $4.02 to $4.14. While guidance represents full-year expectations, we do anticipate growth will be more heavily weighted towards the first half of the year. This is largely due to full-year Semparica Trio sales and a favorable comparison versus Q2 2020 as a result of COVID-19. To summarize, 2020 was another exceptional year in which we delivered 9% operational revenue growth, 
and 10% operational growth in adjusted net income in a year that presented a unique set of challenges. Our guidance for 2021 highlights our ability to grow revenue organically above the market and grow adjusted net income faster than revenue, even during times of elevated investment. Before turning it over to Q&A, I'd like to express how proud I am of our colleagues and all we've accomplished amidst an unprecedented set of circumstances. While there is no assurance that the new year will be without similar challenges faced in 2020, we cannot be more excited about the opportunity to again deliver on a long-term shareholder value proposition. Now, I'll hand things over to the operator to open the line for your questions. Operator? Certainly, and at this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the pound key. Once again, that is star and 1. And we will take our first question from John Block with Stifle. Please go ahead. Thanks, guys. Good morning. Congrats on, on just a great 2020. Um, I'll ask both up front. For the quarter, 4Q20 gross margins were a bit below despite, you know, big companion animal growth. And next year, it seems like you're guiding the flattish call it gross margins again despite what seems like positive mix shifts. So, Glenn, can you talk about that a bit? You know, why are we not seeing a bit more in gross margin considering the companion animal performance? And is expanding gross margin still a part of the long-term story? And then I'll stick with sort of guidance, just, you know, really big numbers on 2021 guidance out of the gate. You talked to livestock versus companion. Can you talk to the components of companion animal a little bit more? I don't know if I specifically heard a TRIO number, but is it safe to assume TRIO of 400 million plus in any other components you'd call out? Thanks, guys. Sure, John. So first, when you look at the, um, the gross margin expectation for 2021, it is relatively flat versus 2020. As you mentioned, the mix with companion animal will be beneficial as we move into 2021. Some of the offsets for that, though, are some of the investments that we're making in other areas, such as reference labs, which come at a lower margin, particularly in the early stage of their life cycle as we're building those labs, the, those labs, the margins will be a little lower until they reach their full operating um, scale. So that's some of the offsets. So there are some positives in terms of the companion animal mix, um, some offsets, though, with some of the longer terms we're investing in other, making in other areas. In terms of uh, the drivers of companion animal growth, so obviously we do expect TRIO to be a significant driver of growth for 2021. We're not putting a specific number on TRIO, but we would expect a contribution from growth in 2021 to be at least as big as what we achieved in 2020. So that will obviously be one of the drivers. Also, continued growth in our dermatology portfolio. We saw very strong performance in 2020 with 23% growth in that portfolio operationally for the year. We do expect that portfolio will exceed a billion dollars as we move into 2021. Also in companion animal diagnostics, we expect very rapid growth in diagnostics as well. You know, in the fourth quarter, we saw 20% growth and we expect that will help carry us forward with the strong momentum that we had in the quarter into 2021, as well as strong performance that we're seeing in many of our emerging markets such as China and Brazil. So those are some of the factors that are driving the strong companion animal growth. Our next question comes from Michael Reiskin with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to ask a quick two-parter. First one's going to be on uh, the livestock markets and just specifically on Jaraxin. Are you starting to see some competition? I know the patents have just rolled off, but um, any early comments you can tell us in terms of pricing uh, from, from competing launches and sort of expect, updated expectations of the market share, but also what steps you're taking and how meaningful of a headwind do you expect in 2021? Um, and then broader on livestock, we've read a lot about input costs going higher on corn, things like that, potentially pressuring uh, producers into markets uh, such as poultry and swine. Um, how does that factor into your outlook for low single-digit growth? Um, and then uh, second question would be just a little bit more on the um, – on the on the companion animal expectations for uh, for 2021. I mean, obviously you're growing well above the market, um, but uh, any thoughts on sort of inline portfolio? And you commented on trio, and you commented on on strong term strength, and what you see in Marbrella, which is going to sort of comment on uh, Revolution Plus um, and on um, on uh, on the rest of the inline portfolio there. Thanks, Mike. Um, so starting on Draxon. Uh, we are expecting a number of competitors um, to enter in the U.S. market. Again, the LOE is this month, so it hasn't happened yet. 
Um, I would say more probably entrance than we expected a few months ago, but we don't think that will last, obviously. I think the market will shake out, obviously, to, to a few. As we said previously, typically we expect about uh, to lose about 20 to 40 percent share over you know several years. In the case of Jackson, given the large number of competitors, we do expect that to be faster, but we don't really expect it to be overall different. Um, and really partly what drives that, I think, is we do believe that a lower price on Draxon will expand the market for macrolides overall, um, and therefore the market itself will, will grow. Uh, we also think we're positioned well from a you know, broad portfolio, strong technical. Um, I, we do expect the, the price to come down in that 20 to 40 percent. Um, that, that is an expectation. But as we said, this is all baked in right now uh, to our guidance. So the expectations around where Draxon is going to be um, is there. And if you look at broader livestock, you reference some of the input costs. Um, you know, as you heard in some of our opening remarks, we are expecting low single-digit growth, so a return to growth in livestock overall. Um, and, you know, some of that will be led in the U.S. and certain species, but a lot of that will be led outside the U.S. As a reminder, about 60 percent of our livestock business is outside of the U.S., and we're seeing incredible growth right now in China and some other markets, Brazil, et cetera. So, you know, overall, we do think some of the input costs in the U.S., you know, will be a pressure, but we have, you know, given the diversity of our portfolio, um, looking at some large markets, our second largest market is China, our third largest market is Brazil. Uh, we do see strength in livestock there. So we overall do believe livestock will return to, you know, low single-digit growth um, in 2021. And, you know, we continue to believe it will return to normal growth, you know, in the mid-single-digit range, you know, four to six um, over the medium term. So, Glenn, I'm not sure if you want to take the incremental question on the broad companion animal trends in 21. Yeah, so the trends for companion animal remain very strong. It's really driven by the breadth of our portfolio. So we talk a lot about the growth that we expect to see from TRIO, from our Durham portfolio, from our diagnostics portfolio. Also in 2021, we'll have the launch of our monoclonal antibodies for pain in Europe, as well as some other markets will also be a key contributor to growth. But then there are uh, other products that round out the portfolio, products such as ProHeart 12, products such as Revolution Plus. Also the growth that we're seeing in markets like China, where a companion animal is growing very rapidly, markets like Brazil. So there are really many areas of growth that we see, and that's driven by the fact that we do have the broadest portfolio in companion animal. We're able to leverage that with our customers. And our next question comes from Louise Chin with Cantor Fitzgerald. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. So what are the macro factors that you see for Zoetis in 2021 as it pertains to livestock, feed prices, weather, any other headwinds or tailwinds that you see out there? Thank you. Sure, Louise, good to, good to hear from you. Um, as you look at livestock overall, um, you know, we're seeing some of the macro trends as sort of a recovery in China um, around ASF is driving a significant portion of the growth from a swine perspective. Um, China is still, you know, going to be importing a decent amount, probably less than in 2020 um, from other markets around the world, sort of maintaining that. We're also hopeful that you'll see an increase in dine out, which will send signals to the industry to expand herds. Um, so, I mean, 2020 was obviously, you know, hit with many different factors, but we do see both an increase in demand um, and in markets where, you know, our technology to really leverage some of the emerging markets, we're, we're seeing significant uptick there. There will remain challenges in some of the, um, you know, U.S. producers obviously for some of the input costs, et cetera. But we do believe you'll see more of a return to normalcy as we move into 2021, and that's why we we're guiding at sort of the low single digit. But we do believe in the medium term we'll be back to sort of the mid single digit overall. And our next question comes from Aaron Wright with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. I'm curious how the multi-formulation approach towards parasiticides is resonating across your customer base. I guess this is a category that you haven't had any sharing historically on the base. And is the underlying cannibalization of legacy products there playing out in line with your expectations? And then um, my second question is on the new pain labs. How should we think about the contributions from them this year? in Europe or other countries, um, will it be meaningful at all? And how should we think about the dynamics that are impacting approval in the U.S.? Do you still anticipate or are you still confident um, that these will be blockbuster products for, blockbuster products for you um, with the launch in the U.S. in 2022? 
Thanks, thanks, Eric. I, I heard the second question on maps, which I can answer. I, you, you were breaking up and digitizing on the first question. I, I think we more or less have it, so let us give it, give it a shot, and you can comment if we missed some of it. We, some of it we heard. So, um, starting on your second question on um, of the maps, we were very excited to now have Labrella approved um, and launching in the first half of this year in you know the EU, Brazil, uh, Canada, and Switzerland, and Silencia. We continue to expect approval in the EU, um, you know, in the first half of this year and to be launching sort of mid-year. We already do have approval on Silencia in Switzerland. Um, and we remain confident in the eventual approval based on the safety and efficacy data we submitted in the U.S. But as you saw in our remarks and our release, the approval timeline has moved out a bit. Uh, we believe this has to do with the fact that this is the first monoclonal antibody approved by the FDA in animal health. Our previous one site point was actually USDA. It's making it a little harder for us, honestly, to predict some of the regulatory process. Uh, we're continuing to work through the regulatory process and manufacturing inspections, um, and we'll continue to keep you updated. We, we don't think that changes the overall, you know, uh, peak sales of this product at all, um, but it is a slightly, you know, different process. And I guess Glenn might have understood a little bit better, but we'll try your first question. Let's yeah. know if we missed it. Yeah, so Aaron, I think your question was around how we're performing with the breadth of our portfolio from Paris to the side with our customers. And I think that's going very well in the veterinary clinics. We're really able to offer our customers a variety of options based on how they want to best treat um, the animals. And I think that shows in the performance that we saw in the Simparica franchise in 2020. Not only did we exceed our goals for TRIO with $170 million in sales in the year, but we also saw significant growth in Simparica, which really exceeded our expectations. So we grew operationally 16% with Simparica. So what we saw was that the advertising and driving patients into the clinic for Simparica Trio actually benefited the overall portfolio. And we also saw a very positive growth in ProHeart at 12 as well. So we think the breadth of the portfolio and the parasiticides was really a benefit and our, our field colleagues were really able to execute very well with that portfolio. Was that your question or do we get it all? I'll be my car. All right, you can come back in the queue if we missed you. Sorry about that, and do a little bit digital. Okay, we'll take our next question from John Krieger with William Blair. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Just uh, maybe a quick follow-up on uh, the Labrella and Silencia timeline in the U.S. Do you have a sense for how far pushed back the, the approval timing might be, and do you think you need to collect additional clinical data? Um, yeah, we, we don't have a, a great sense right now. We're still working through the regulatory and manufacturing process. You know, we also, um, the, the FDA is going to require inspections um, of facilities that are outside the U.S., so the exact timing of when they're going to be able to do that is a little bit uncertain. So I don't have a great sense. Um, of not, if we did, we would have obviously given more specific guidance. We do not expect it to be in 2021, which is what we're being clear on now. And as soon as we know more, we'll, we'll be happy to update, you know, in future calls going forward. But Unfortunately, I don't have greater. Again, we remain, you know, very confident that it will eventually be approved, um, but we need to go through a new process um, with a regulator that has an, an animal health under CVM approved monoclonal antibodies previously. So it's a little bit different for us. So um, this is the best we know at this point. Great, thank you. Um, and then a second question: Can you maybe just sort of frame the the diagnostics plan for uh, 21? Um, it seems like uh, results are starting to accelerate there. Um, are any of the investments being focused in the livestock, or should we really think about your efforts right now being concentrated with companion animal? Sure. For 2021, our focus remains on companion animal. Uh, we're very um, pleased with our progress on placements, which is a really good leading indicator um, of usage. Uh, as you saw, we had double-digit um, you know, consumable growth as well, which we're quite pleased with. Um, as we look at, you know, new products we've added, the Images platform, we're excited with its first indication, obviously, in SQL. That's the AI-powered um, one. Uh, we're looking for additional indications there. So, you know, the last piece there would also be reference labs. So we're continuing to expand um, our U.S. reference labs. We'll be probably adding about three to five more labs this year. Uh, so, you know, we believe diagnostics is a core part of our portfolio. It's a market that grows at 10% plus. Um, we're really pleased that we're starting to see some strong momentum across, you know, the different parts of it. So both, you know, reference lab as well as placements as well as consumable. So we remain very committed to the space and are pleased with our progress over there. And our next question comes from David Westenberg with Guggenheim Securities. Please go ahead. 
Hi, um, thank you for taking the questions and uh, congrats on a great year. Um, can you give us a little bit of flavor on where Trio is taking share from? I think you mentioned there's some new to the category, but I'm just kind of getting a trying to get a flavor. Is it you know, legacy, um, just regular safe flea and tick? Are, I mean, what, what component is heartworm? And basically what I'm trying to do is mar uh, get a good sense of, of how big this can grow in terms of both, um, both the heartworm market and the flea and tick market. And then just a second um, related question on, on Trio. Is there any synergies, particularly on a sales synergy from the direct to consumer marketing campaign that it might be able to benefit maybe um, Derm uh, or maybe even there's a cost synergy? So uh, thank you very much. Sure. So starting on the, um, the Trio, we, we did see an, uh, an increase in share in Q4 of uh, 7%. So we are taking share in you know, the number of places that's coming from. Um, if you think about it, you know, the first is uh, new puppies, where I think we're doing quite well with new, I think, puppies. Also, new people to the category overall, I would say, people who, you know, maybe previously had gotten products, you know, over the counter are moving in. And we are taking share from some of the um, other established competitors, um, you know, in the space. So I think we're seeing strong growth overall, I would say, um, there. And, you know, pleased at our share. If you look at the potential for the product, um, you know, the two competitors, both, you know, NextGuard, um, and Brevecto are each $600 million products a day. So we continue to believe there's significant growth. We are we remain under-indexed, to be honest with you, in parasiticide, so we continue to see this um, as a significant part of our overall growth. growth. From a sense of is, are there synergies with Derm, um, not really is what I would say, except for on the cost side. Obviously, we can get better buying power um, when you place DTC ads by leveraging the spend across both. But beyond that, we don't see, you know, strong synergies, honestly, between the DTC on one, you know, affecting the other, unless, you know, a clinic has to carry both and things like that. But we think maybe the only synergy there is just in our buying power by leveraging the you know, combined DTC spend. And we can go to our next question from Nathan Rich with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for the questions. Um, Kristen, maybe to start, you know, what, what do you think the launch curve looks like for um, products like Labrella and Salentia? Obviously, a new way for um, vets to treat osteoarthritis and chronic pain. I guess, you know, kind of what are your initial kind of impressions on sort of the level of demand that's out there for, from vets for this type of treatment? And how will Labrella be priced relative to existing treatments on the market? You know, I know it can be kind of up to $100 a month here in the U.S. I'm sure it varies a lot by market, but just any, any comment on pricing would be helpful. Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the life cycle for Labrella and Silencia and the curve will be a slightly different. Labrella is, you know, entering a market that's, you know, $400 million today. Um, so it's an established market. So I think the ability for, you know, people are already bringing their dogs in for, you know, uh, OA pain. So I think we have the opportunity with Labrella to expand the number of patients uh, given the safety and efficacy profile and the compliance benefits of the product. Um, I think we can also increase days on therapy, so it, which also helps us grow the market. And then obviously price to your point, so it is priced at a premium to many of the products uh, on the market today. It is not, obviously, we don't have a price in the U.S. since we, we don't um, even have an approval yet in the U.S. Um, I think Salenti is going to be a little bit different. I think the curve is going to take a little longer. Um, and that has to do with the fact that there really isn't a market today in, in most parts of the world. Uh, if you had a cat who had it, there really was no treatment. So cat owners have kind of been conditioned to not uh, bring their cats in. We started focusing, you know, about a year ago uh, to try to build that market, um, make pet owners aware what um, OA pain looks like in cats, um, and get encouraged them to start bringing their cats uh, to the vet and then getting vets to treat that. Uh, we think it's a significant market, but you have to first medicalize some of these conditions and treat it. It's significant. There's, you know, 60 uh, million cats in the U.S. today, um, and really only about 40 percent of them have OA, but only 18 percent of them are really identified by vets. So we think both are significant markets that we can grow the market. Silencia is more about create a mar creating a market, and I think you can look at our success in doing that um, with dermatology, with Apical and Cytopoint. So we're investing early, um, as Glenn has been talking about um, in some of the guidance over the last year and for 2021, in building those markets. But I would assume the curve for Labrella will be much faster than the curve for Silencia as we're building a market. And our next question comes from Balaji Prasad with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi, right, good morning, and uh, congratulations on the results. A uh, couple of questions from me. Firstly, uh, since livestock recovery this year seems to be 
so contingent on China, uh, and there are news of unregulated or illegal vaccines being used and the recurrence of ACF. So I want to understand what you're seeing on the ground and how should we wrap our heads around the reherding cycle in 2021. Uh, second, on operating margins, considering that uh, you will not have the dilutive impact of diagnostics that you saw in 2020, uh, should we be looking for better operating margins considering that revenue mix is better, uh, livestock should be in a recovery, and, uh, and if so, what are the offsets to this? Thanks. Sure. So when you look at overall livestock, and particularly in China, so we've seen very positive performance in livestock in China this year. So from a livestock perspective, we grew 45% in China this year, and we expect continued strong performance in China in 2021 as we continue to see the herd rebuild recovery from African swine fever. And where we're seeing that recovery is particularly in our larger accounts. And the larger accounts use more of the multinational products and of our premium products. So we've seen a really rapid acceleration of our growth. For example, in the second half of the year in swine, in particular in 2020, we grew over 100% in swine in China. And we expect you know, very positive momentum moving into 2021 and very significant growth from China in 2021. In terms of um, the operating margins, there are a couple of things to, to look at as we move into 2021. A number of areas of investments that we have in our SG&A, really continuing to support the growth of TRIO, as well as the monoclonal antibodies for pain, as well as dermatology. We've increased our DTC investment in 2020, particularly around TRIO and derm, and we plan on continuing that in 2021 as we saw a very positive return on investment there. Obviously, we'll continue to invest in R&D, um, and that'll be an area of continued investment as we've seen a very positive return on that investment as well. The other thing to consider when you look at the overall guidance, which with revenue growing 9 to 11% and income growing 9 to 12%, one of the reasons that income isn't growing more rapidly is the change in assumption and tax rate between 2020 and 2021. In 2020, our rate was 18.3%. Our guidance for 2021 is approximately 20%. If you neutralize for the impact of the tax rate, our adjusted net income would actually be growing 2% faster, so more 11 to 14%. So we are seeing margin expansion, but the impact of the tax rate is diluting that to some degree. And we'll go next to Chris Schott with JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much. Can you uh, talk of first maybe a bit about innovation on the livestock side? Um, it seems like the market between COVID and some other dynamics has been kind of a bit lackluster in terms of growth the last few years. So what does it take to get back to mid-single-digit growth on the livestock side, and what are some of the bigger innovation trends we should be watching there? And then my second question, which is following up on the, the topic of margins, as we start looking up to 2022 and beyond, sh should we be thinking about a sustained window of higher – expense growth as you get many of these new launches off the ground? Or has a lot of that groundwork already been, I guess, invested as we go into 20 and 21? I'm just trying to get a sense of how we should think about longer-term margin expansion, expansion dynamics, assuming we continue this very healthy top-line uh, setup that seems to be playing out. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have been talking about the fact that to really get to the mid-single digits, um, you know, in a sustainable way, we, we, you're going to need innovation. I think there's a few spaces that where you're already starting to see that and some that will be coming. Um, the first is around the vector vaccine space, uh, which we've been talking about. Um, in 2020, we launched our first one in the U.S. for Newcastle. Uh, in 2021, we launched one for IVD. We're looking for more launches there. Um, you know, this is, you know, a significant market. It's about a $300 million market, you know, growing double digits. So we do see vector technology and poultry, which is one of the faster growing species, being, you know, an area of innovation and growth for us. We also think more broadly that immunotherapies are going to be really important for two reasons. Uh, one, they're an alternative to antibiotics. Uh, and secondly, healthier animals are more productive. So it also increases uh, productivity for producers. So I think immunotherapies, which we've been working on for a while and have a partnership with Colorado State to develop, will be important. The other sector that I think is really important to focus on is precision livestock farming, uh, which we also think has great potential. You know, we're leaders right now um, in the genetic space there, in genetic testing. We also, uh, you know, purchased PLA, as you know. We're looking at really that's about individual animal care and herd monitoring, and I think that's you know probably the next big wave. That's probably more of a medium you know term growth driver. 
But I think there's a number of spaces where you're going you know, to see you know, innovation at the livestock you know, spot, so across vectors, immunotherapies, and precision livestock farming. I'll let Glenn take the second question on long-term margin expansion. Yeah, so in terms of the long-term margin expansion, I think there are a couple of factors to con consider. So for 2021, we mentioned that the gross margin is relatively flat and talked about some of the drivers of that with some of the investments we're making in reference labs. Also, the impact of the Drax and LOE this year on gross margin. So as we move into 2022 and beyond, some of those impacts will be a little less, and we would expect to see continued expansion in gross margin. In terms of the overall operating expenses, you know, beyond 2021, obviously there will be one year where T&E normalizes when things get back to normal from COVID. But beyond that impact, we would expect that we would continue to be able to grow our expenses at a pace below that of revenue. So we'll probably continue to grow R&D in line with revenue. Um, you know, that may vary any given year based on the opportunities. But SG&A, based on the infrastructure that we have globally established, we should be able to grow that somewhere between inflation and revenue. So we would expect to continue to see expansion there on an overall operating margin perspective. Our next question will come from David Rissinger with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks very much, and let me add my uh, congrats on uh, another phenomenal year as well. Uh, so I have two questions. First, with respect to the monoclonal antibody approval delays, so it's for both cats and dogs, but it wasn't quite clear to me whether uh, the FDA wants more clinical data or whether there are manufacturing issues because or manufacturing questions, because I think, Kristen, you had mentioned uh, manufacturing. So if, if you could just clarify on both of them uh, what the FDA issues are, whether they're clinical or manufacturing. And then uh, second, Zoetis's R&D has obviously been uh, amazingly differentiated from competitors. Uh, competitors struggle to bring blockbuster companion animal products to market, even including follow-ons to Zoetis's top growth drivers over several years. And so considering that, can you just help us understand the unique aspects of Zoetis's R&D and its ability to maintain separation from the competition? Thank you. Sure, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, with regards to the monoclonal antibodies, Labrella and Silencia, um, you know, it really is just working through the regulatory process and, you know, the questions that they're asking and, you know, they're requiring inspections of sites. So at this point, we have not been asked for any clinical data, but we're still in the regulatory process is what I would say. Um, you know, it is the first time doing this with the FDA, so it's just honestly a new process for both. And understandably, it's the first time they're looking at some of these types of products, so they have a number of questions. So it really is just going through the regulatory review process and trying to manage new manufacturing inspections, which I do think that's probably the well, COVID is definitely affecting that a little bit, but um, we're just working through that. So at this point, we have not been asked for any additional um, clinical data, and we don't think there's any manufacturing issues at this point. We're just still working through the review process and what their expectations are. Um, with regards to Zoetis R&D, you, know, you know, what I would say is I think it's the partnership between R&D manufacturing and our commercial organization. It's taking those insights the commercial has of customer needs um, and partnering early on with R&D to develop products. I think the other thing we've done really well is partner with manufacturing to be able to scale those products and be able to bring them to market. Um, we manufacture our own monoclonal antibodies. As you know, we've got very strong manufacturing capabilities, which you know is, I think, important for launching many of the products and scaling up um, at the level. We certainly learned the hard way early on in our journey about investing in that partnership when we saw some of the challenges we had uh, supplying Apoquel. So I think from an R&D perspective, obviously I think we have great scientists, but I think it's the rigorous part process and partnership they have with our commercial and our manufacturing colleagues um, and our willingness to invest in disruptive technologies and take those risks um, that we've been doing, you know, we've been managing um, over the last eight years. Anything you'd add there, Glenn? No, I think it's exactly what you said, Kristen. We talked about the interconnected capabilities between commercial manufacturing and R&D, and I think that works extremely well here. Like Kristen said, identifying, you know, what the key needs are in the marketplace early on, coming up with solutions, and making sure that the products that we're able to manufacture, and we've been very successful in doing that. 
Our next question will come from Kathy Miner with Cowan and Company. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thank you. First question I have is uh, relates again to the monoclonals. Can you just clarify when you talked about uh, plant site inspections being needed? Um, is it correct then that both, uh, either one or both of the monoclonals, are manufactured outside of the U.S.? Um, the second question also on the products is: is the intention to launch both the cat and dog ones at the same time? Is there an advantage to doing one or the other? And we can speak just about the EU markets where you have approval. And the second question on the Derm products, you've targeted a billion in sales for this year. Can you talk about some of the drivers behind that? Is it outside of the U.S.? Is it more pe more pets, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, sure. So you're, first of all, Kathy, great to hear from you. Um, secondly, on the mass, uh, they are both, um, the manufacturing facilities are different for them, but they are outside the U.S. Um, and, you know, prior approval inspections, you know, regulators handle them differently, but um, they are going to be required probably for both of these products, and they are both different, but they are both um, outside of the U.S. Um, and I think your second question was around uh, the Durham sales growth, U.S. or ex-U.S. You know, it's both. Um, you know, we still believe we're under, under penetrated outside the U.S. There's the same number of dogs in the U.S. Um, and outside of the U.S., yet two-thirds of our sales in Durham remain in the U.S. So we do think there's a significant opportunity. It has been harder to get, you know, scale outside the U.S. historically, mostly because we've not been able to do direct-to-consumer advertising that is brand-specific. Uh, one of the investments we are going to make for the first time is doing just overall disease awareness direct-to-consumer advertising in 2021. So we cannot be specific with brand, but in Durham, we really are the only product. So hopefully if you raise awareness around a disease and that there are treatments, um, you can encourage people to speak to their vet um, and get the best care. So that, I think, is one of the reasons why international, we are hoping, will start to grow faster. But I have to give our U.S. team tremendous credit. They continue to grow the market. The investment in direct-to-consumer advertising, raising awareness that there are products, are bringing more pets in and getting more pets treated. And in the U.S., there are still 6 million dogs who, you know, have, you know, who need our products. Um, or need a Durham solution who aren't getting one. So we do believe there's still growth in the U.S., although we would expect, although I'm sure, I know in the last few years we've seen very strong growth out of the U.S., we would expect over time for the U.S. growth, you know, to start to decline the overall growth and more of the growth to come from international, but we still believe there's significant potential um, in both. And our next question will come from Elliot Wilbur with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, and uh, congratulations on the uh, strong performance of Trio in a, in a challenging year. Um, Kristen, just maybe want to dive in a little bit more on the launch details around the product. Seems like obviously one of the reasons for its relative success this year versus earlier expectations was just far less cannibalization of. Symperica than originally expected, but wondering if you could just share with us additional metrics in terms of where you are with respect to, you know, clinic penetration rates, how many targeted clinics have you been able to, you know, actually reach, um, just you know, additional metrics around the uptake and, and launch w would be helpful. Then just thinking about the product longer term, obviously a very strong First year, well, if I think about launch analogs on the human health side, I mean, generally five years out, you're looking at something on the order of six to 10x first year sales. Not sure if that's applicable in the companion animal market, but just some thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, maybe longer term launch analogs with respect to the product. Thanks. Sure. Um with regards to the launch of TRIO, uh, I would say there's a lot of uh, unique characteristics of that TRIO launch. A, we launched at the height of the pandemic in the U.S., um, so I'm not sure how to compare that to other people's launches. Um, you know, we were slower to penetrate clinics, I would say, um, in Q2 and Q3, but we're quite pleased that by the end of the year, we reached all of our penetration goals. So I, I think our penetration has been quite strong. You know, given the delay, really the outperformance was our share once we were penetrated within the clinic. Um, the ability to get more of the patients on our product has been really strong, and that gives us good confidence um, as we move into 2021. As Glenn mentioned a few minutes earlier, we are expecting a similar contribution. For starters, we'll have a Q1 where we didn't have sales last year, but with the penetration we were able to achieve by the end of the year, which is, you know, reaching the goals we had wanted, we think if we can just get the same pull through that we had you know, at those clinics, you know, in 2021, we'll continue to see uh, great growth across, the, um, you know, 
there. We're also seeing it also pull our broader parasiticide uh, portfolio. So I'm not sure I would say I would use a human health analog, but you know, I continue to remind everybody we're, we remain underpenetrated in this space. And Paris is the single biggest category um, in the animal health space. It's $4 billion globally with $2.5 billion in the U.S. You know, continuing to see about 16% growth in Semperica beyond TRIO, you know, globally, it, it shows there, there's significant opportunity here for us to continue to grow. And we were quite pleased if you looked at, you know, overall in Paris, we had an increase in share of 7% in Q4. So we think we can continue to take share in this and grow it overall. So I'm not sure it looks like human health, um, but, you know, with our biggest competitors already being $600 million products, I think we've got, you know, strong ability to continue to grow and to, um, you know, get at least our fair share in this space. Yeah, and the only, the only thing I'd add to that in terms of the question on peak sales, what becomes challenging with peak sales is the timing of competition, and that, that remains unknown. Obviously, for 2021, our current guidance does not expect another triple combo within the U.S., um, and the timing of that will obviously impact what our overall peak sales could be for the product. And our next question will come from Nabeen Jacob with UBS. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the question. This is uh, Shrieker Nutty Forum on for Nivy and Jacob. I just uh, have a couple of specific questions. Um, can you quantify the, the revenue impact in, in 2020 of the earlier fall cattle, cattle run? And do you expect this to, to recur, this adverse negative revenue impact, do you expect it to recur in 2021? And then can you quantify the difference in gross margin and di diagnostics from your therapeutics portfolio or your corporate average? Thanks very much. Yeah, so in terms of the impact of the early fall cattle run for 2020, that did not have an impact for the year. That was just a seasonal impact between Q3 and Q4. I think you saw the very strong performance in Q3. You saw the opposite occur in Q4 of this year. And then predicting the seasonality of that in 2021 obviously is difficult, but we focus more on the full year, obviously, in terms of uh, the overall impact. In terms of gross margin for the uh, diagnostic business, we don't specifically provide um, gross margins by therapeutic area or by species, but overall we always say our companion animal business obviously has the higher margin. Diagnostics in general is lower than some of our key therapeutic areas. And our next question will come from David Steinberg with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Thanks. I have two questions. Um, purchase and uh, rising pet adoptions, obviously one of the tailwinds from the pandemic is decreased adoptions um, around the country and around the world. And in previous comments, I think you said there were about uh, 3.2 million adoptions annually. I'm just uh, curious, now that 2020 is in the books, do you actually have any data on how many more adoptions there were um, last year? Um, and the other tailwind, you know, you've called out is just the increase in dollars per, per vet visit. Um, and as, as most pet owners get vaccinated, as they go back to work, you know, how durable do you think both the do increased dollars per visit and uh, increased adoptions are? And is there any chance that could reverse uh, when most people are back in the office? And just a, a follow-up question on trio um, comp potential trio competition. I think, Glenn, you said no expectations for um, competition this year. You previously had said um, no competition in the first half of this year. When do you actually, I know it's murky, but when do you actually think there might be your first competitor? And, and also, what gives you such great confidence that there would not be any competition um, in 2020 when I simply ask that? Because with such a successful launch, it's obviously a target for, uh, for any competitors. Thanks. Sure. Um, with regards to pet adoption, uh, there are 135 million pets in the U.S. In a typical year, um, you see about 3.2 million adoptions. So even a, you know, 10% increase in that isn't going to, you know, dramatically change things. But we are seeing an increase in vet visits, uh, which we think is a positive trend. And we do expect that to continue in 2021. So as Glenn mentioned earlier, you know, we did see a 2% increase in vet visits in Q4. We are expecting that to continue. So I think you are seeing maybe a proportional to what was the incremental pets that were adopted. We don't have very specific numbers, but you know, I would say, you know, assume it's somewhere between like two and 10%, you know, there, it'll be helpful. And I do think we're going to continue to see an increase in visits. You asked as well about spend per visit, which was incredibly strong. 
uh, in 2020. We don't believe it's going to remain that strong, to be honest with you. We still think it will grow. Um, if you look, generally speaking, at our space, um, you do, we've seen overall revenues of clinics um, growing in the mid to high single digits on a, a normal year. You know, I'm not sure what 2021 is going to look like, but, you know, assuming it's somewhere, you know, close to a normal year, we do think you're going to see, you know, strong growth overall there in, you know, spend overall revenue in the vet clinic, both with growth in total number of visits as well as a spend per visit. With regards to the trio question on com competition, you know, we don't have the visibility that human health has as to when we'll get competitors. To be very frank, we would have expected a competitor by now. Um, we would have expected one in Durham as well. So we're not.